Hello, and welcome to Artists on Artwork, the Growing Thunder Collective on Carl Bodmer. My name is Anne Meisinger, and I'm an assistant educator for public programs and creative practice at the Met. It's a tremendous pleasure to be introducing today's program, which is being presented in conjunction with the exhibition, Carl Bodmer, North American Portraits, on view at the Met Fifth Avenue from April 5th to July 25th, 2021. The exhibition features Bodmer's watercolor paintings of the landscape of the North American interior and its indigenous peoples, made during an expedition to the Northwestern reaches of the Missouri River in 1833 and 34. I am privileged to be speaking to you from the ancestral homelands of the Canarsie people and respectfully acknowledge the Met's location in Lapinoking, the homeland of the Lenape diaspora, and historically a gathering and trading place for many diverse Native peoples who continue to live and work on the island. We'll be joined today by my colleague Thayer Tolls, Maritza F. Vilcek, Curator of American Painting and Sculpture here at the Met. Thayer joined the American Wing staff in 1992, and she's organized numerous exhibitions at the Met including Carl Bodmer, North American Portraits, which has been organized in partnership with the Jocelyn Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. The women of the Growing Thunder family, Joyce, Juanita, and Jessere, embody the intergenerational continuity of their artistic tradition. They are three generations of highly accomplished, well-respected, and prolific bead and quill artists from the Northern Plains. A warm welcome to Thayer and the Greg Thunders. Thank you, Anne, for your kind introduction. Hello, and again, I'm Thayer Tulls, Maritza Filchek, Curator of American Painting and Sculpture at the Met. I'm privileged to join you from Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people. Today, I'm thrilled to be here with Joyce, Juanita, and Jessa Ray Growing Thunder for our Artists on Artworks program and to discuss the exhibition, Carl Bodmer, North American Portraits, the impact of uh, Bodmer's watercolors on their artwork and their practice both individually and collectively as quill work and beadwork artists. I know how um, important love of family and intergenerational collaboration is to them. So it's so nice to see you all together in New Mexico after I know what was a period of a very long separation. Um, so welcome. And I'd like to ask you each to introduce yourself. Uh, good day to all my relations. My name is Jessa Ray Growing Thunder. Um, the Growing Thunder family, we originally come from Chelsea, Montana, um, but we call Poplar, Montana our home. Um, we come from the Fort Peck Reservation in the far northeast corner of Montana. I am the granddaughter, um, the daughter. I am also a mother, a wife, a sister, an auntie, and uh, a third generational beadwork and quillwork artist. And I'm thrilled to be here with you all today. Hello, my name is Joyce Gurring Thunder. I'm uh, from the Fort Peck Indian Reservation, Northeastern Montana, Poplar, Montana. And um, I'm glad to, to be here on this interview. Ha Matakiapi, we need a Gurring Thunder Fogarty. And I'm excited to be here to talk about the Bodmer exhibition today so it's gonna be fun the the quilt that you're all sitting in front of is so striking can you tell us a bit about it yeah so behind us um this is my own my own personal collection of uh star quilts and so there's about i think there's about nine star quilts um stacked up behind us and so um, star quilts are, are really specific to where we come from um, the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux peoples and um, you know they're they're a blessing to be given it's just like a, an honoring because 
to have a blanket was a status of wealth. Um, you know, it comes during that era of, you know, being given uh, fabric along with the rations, mm -hmm. right? And and learning to be creative with how we how we create things. And so our women began doing star quilts. And so now it's a status of wealth and of honor to be given these. And so I've been really fortunate in my life um, that I've been in these various roles and um, I've been given these gifts. And so I, I love to have them out to, to always make sure that if anybody comes in my home, they know, you know, I carry, I carry my grandmas with me. A lot of these were given to me by my grandmas. Um, like I said, I'm a grandma's girl. Mm -hmm. I love all my grandmas. <laughs> <laughs> and so they like uh, you should yeah mm -hmm. you should explain the kinship of the grandmas in yeah. our society our our grandmas you know um i think there's a lot of of misunderstanding about our our kinship systems and where we come from you know on our dakota and dakota blood you know our our women are in the center of everything you know we were we were women centered, we were matrilineal traditionally. Um, of course, we had a balance though as well, right? But, um, you know, our grandmas are how we identify ourselves. You know, I come from my grandma and, and, and how our kinship system is set up is we're, we're very tight knit. You know, my grandma's brothers and sisters are also my grandparents. So all of her sisters that she has, even all the ones that she has adopted, you know, throughout her life. I called them all grandma and, and my mom, you know, she, she has all her brothers, um, you know, my uncles, they're my fathers. Um, and so all of us cousins, we all call each other brothers and sisters. And so that's kind of how our kinship system works. It's wonderfully inclusive. Well, I know, um, as I mentioned, how important family is and Joyce, your grandmas have had such an influence getting you started in beadwork and quill work, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. I was raised by my grandmother Josephine Greyhawk, and um, we used to go visit my other grandmothers that lived up on on. Um, on the hill. One of my grandmas, Elizabeth Jones, she's, she was a, a bead worker and she did beautiful big beaded tops like the one here. And uh, I was so impressed like I was like five or six years old. And um, to see her just sitting on the bed beading and she'd have like one part done and the other parts were just plain and she just did it by, she didn't use uh, like drawn, drawn out or anything. It just all came out of her head because she's done so many, so much of it. I've been uh, beaten like this um, ever since I was, like a young girl young girl <laughs> young girl when i could get my own materials and um that's what i it was always uh like i was meant to to do this i really enjoy doing it now and like i i'm um I guess I'm sort of different, like for my daughter, because when I work on one project or be beaded piece, I always work on one thing and try to finish it. That's what I do anyway. So I've been working on this dress. This is a beaded, solid beaded tops like my grandmother's made. And I'm beading this for my granddaughter, Jessa. It's beaded in, in red because that's an honor color. And um, 
I'm trying to finish it. It'll be finished by the spring. Yeah, she doesn't draw things out or plan mm -hmm. it out. It's a um, really organic type of thing when she starts going. And she'll she'll know what design she's going to put where and everything. So, And that's just like how, you know, she grew up watching her grandma's bead, you know, and she talks about, you know, there was nothing here. You know, there was no, no guidelines, no drawn out pattern or design because they just knew. And that's what's always amazing watching you know, my Unchi work, my grandma, is because everything is just so natural, right? Yeah, it's organic. It's, it's organic because you don't know which way the uh, materials are going to go or how your bead patterns might be just a little bit different than you thought. And But she just, it's like the way her hands work, it's, it's almost like a muscle memory. Um, they just do it. And it just happens for her. Whereas I think both of us, you know, we like to, to draw things out we and to know what's plan. Gonna go down. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to Joy talk about growing up with her grandmas, one of the first things Jessa Ray told me was about how when you visited non-native families when you were a young girl, you didn't understand why they weren't beating. And understood the importance of beadwork and quill work to your people and um what how old were you when you began to bead um well that's the thing is you know my my grandma she she always talks about like she she was put here for this you know she was put here to bead and to do these things um and, and my mom and my grandma you know they don't take days off they they do this every single day. And this was how I grew up. You know, I, I grew up surrounded by beads and by quills and, you know, this was just normal to me. And I picked up my own first needle and thread by the time I was three, um, just because I, I was an eight, I, it seemed natural. And, um, I remember being about five or six years old and I went to my friend's house and I understood that I was native and my friend wasn't. I, I understood that. But for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why her mom wasn't beating. I just could not figure that out. And I remember this, it was a very pivotal moment in my life. And I remember it so vividly because I went home and I asked my mom, you know, well, why? Well, why are you doing this every day? Like, why, why do you bead? Why does grandma bead? And my mom explained it to me and throughout my life, she, she's always making sure I have a firm understanding in this, that, you know, we have to do these things every day. It's our responsibility as the Kota Nakota women that we, we pick up our needle and thread. If we do something like bead or quill, um, or we dance or we pray, all these little things help make sure that our culture is here and that our culture is surviving for the next generation. Well, the mat is a familiar place for the Growing Thunders, and I'm, I'm happy to note that Joyce has two works in the Mets holding, including this female doll from 2000, which was gifted to the museum in 2011 as part of the co-collection. Joyce, is there anything you would like to say about this doll? Yes, so uh, Ted had, a, had a, a dress top, like the, the top the square top, the beaded dress. It's it's really a, like a cape. And it was made for a little girl or something. And I was really admiring it. And and um, I said, boy, that is really nice. I said, I bet you I could put that in a little miniature for a doll. He said, sure, Joyce could do that. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I did that for him. So it's a, a replica of an Assiniboine dress top. Yes. For a little girl that Ted Ralph T. Coe owned. And uh, my mother and Ted had a special friendship. And um, they were always visiting. She was always over at his house. He was always over at our house. And um, so it was kind of a challenge to her, I guess, is what he he said he put forth when he said sure Joyce go ahead <laughs> yeah make a doll 
and she did. Yeah. I think she's beautiful. Yeah. Well, one of the things in working on this Bodmer exhibition with my colleagues here and at the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, um, we wanted to flip the narrative and really focus on the ancestors. And um, this is how I met Jessa Ray, because we worked with 10 indigenous uh, artists, scholars, and tribal elders to produce writing about the portraits for the exhibition. And Jessa Ray wrote about Noah Pa. And I'm wondering if you might read what you wrote um, for us now. Bodmer's depictions of Assiniboine peoples along the Missouri serve as primary studies of historical beadwork and quillwork practices. This portrait of Nopa with his buffalo robe draped over his shoulder tells us he was a respected warrior. His shirt is adorned with pony trader blue beaded strips down the arms and a pop of red tra trade wool along the collar, signifying that he possessed the wealth and status to obtain these items. A quilled rosette sits in the center of his shirt possibly to emulate the thunder or another power entity, a common practice in warrior regalia. His headdress is customary Assiniboine attire, complete with a split horn adorned with yellow horsehair tips, feathers, and wrapped quillwork extending down the sides. Thank you. And I think it bears mentioning, Jessere, that you are both an artist and a scholar of quill work and beadwork and putting the finishing touches on your PhD dissertation for UC Davis. So I know this is a source of great pride for your family. And I know, Jessere, you wrote about having um, grown up with Bodmer, books with Bodmer um, illustrations open um, it, at your house. Yeah. Um... You know, being able to to reference this era and you know these these histories really, um, it was always a part of, of growing up in my household of, of artists, right? That you know we always had, you know, and my mom she would always have his books open, and you know she would be looking at these portraits, she'd be looking at the very detailed things like like the hair ornaments, you know, that's you know that's a deep part of our history that you know without these portraits, without you know these things documented, you know, who knows how we would be able to hold on to these histories, mm -hmm. um, but to actually have the images, you know, to have it represented, you know, it'd be one thing to see them um, or to have stories about them, but to actually see the adornment, to see how everything was worn, um, you know, that's an amazing reference point. And so being able to, to grow up with this and then, you know, here I am all these years later and, and being asked to contribute to this exhibition was a huge honor. And it was amazing to, to kind of come that full circle, you know, as a, a practicing beadworker and quill worker, but also as, you know, I'm, I'm gaining my PhD and, and I consider myself an indigenous scholar who, who focuses on um, indigenous arts. And so being able to kind of come full circle with all of these, these moments in my life and to help contribute to this was a huge honor. I think when when you look at Noah Pa and some of the dolls that you've created, there's definitely a correlative relationship between them. And I wondered if you could talk about the process of making a Cinnaboyne chief. Yeah. So, of course, I I was inspired by you know the Bodmers sketches and stuff and and that it always helped me in understanding the perspective of the shirt sizes and um you know that they were long and elegant and you had to realize that deer were bigger back then <laughs> you know they were larger animals and so they were more graceful and um it really helped me to understand the clothing and everything and so my inspiration from these was that I was trying to explore just a little bit later than Bodmer style. So I was doing um, just like 1860s, maybe in this uh, Cinnaboyne chief. And, but I was inspired by looking at the Bodmer drawings because you can see such detail like in the leggings 
I saw one of them had uh, quill work plating on the leggings. And so I knew I wanted to do quill work platings. And then I also knew I didn't want to do just a big single rosette shirt. I want, wanted people to understand there were all types of war shirts. And so I chose to do uh, double quill work rosettes on this. And I think, I don't know what year I did this, but I think um, Jessa was still a kid. Can, do you remember the stall working on the stall? No. I remember the saddle. The saddle. The saddle that he's carrying. I oh, remember that. Yeah. So the shirt is all quill work and then it's edged with uh, micro beads and in a uh, checkered style, which is typical of the Cinnaboying stuff, which I know because of the Bodmer <laughs> drawings. So it was all just a learning experience with me when we started getting more detailed with these little figures was um, this was a great reference point for me. And then every time that I look through these books and these these photographs and stuff, I can see different details that I missed before. Talking about scale, um, how do you even begin to approach a project of this scale and complexity? <laughs> Well, my mother is fearless and has <laughs> never been afraid to start a big project. And when she was approached by um, an MAI to do this dress, she said, oh, yeah, I could do it. So uh, when she was approached to ask and asked to do this dress, um, she set herself the deadline. that She wanted to tell her family story about this dress. And... Um, so it inspired me that when she got her whole thing, she knew what she was going to put on it and why she was putting it there. And I thought, I'm going to help her and I'll, I'll make a breastplate for her, Colbert breastplate, just just to, so it looks its finest. But um, Jessa also, when I told her I was going to make the quilt breastplate to go with it, Jessa jumped up and said she wanted to help too. And so she said she could do a, bl a blanket band. But I think the whole process of why it was organic is grandma knew exactly what story she wanted to tell and what history she wanted to make sure she was representing. And when she knew that and she just, you know, the minute they approached her about this dress, she she knew. She knew exactly what it was going to be, what it was going to look like and what it was going to say. And that was inspiring. And I think, you know, it was innate that mom and I just, you know, okay, well, we'll help you, you know. Joyce, can you tell us the story um, because it is so personal and meaningful to hear it. Um, it just gives it gives this dress so much more um, impact. Well, I, I made it because my um, grandfather was uh, um, one of the the big committee members of the oil celebration and when he wanted to honor do the honor for one of the grandkids or that was on the committees or he would get one of his horses and he would tie it on the horse tie a war bonnet on the horse and um have the the dance and for it and when when um when the dance was through all the the cowboys or, and dancers they all had their ropes ready and so my grandfather would turn the horse loose and whoever caught it could have it with the war bonnet and that's how he honored us, grandkid, his grandkids. One of the design elements on this dress that's really important to us are the the elongated rectangle designs on the the sleeve of the dress. Um, these were important to us because we have a style of hand drum that comes from our area in Chelsea, Montana, and they're a square hand drum. And while uh, Sitting Bull was staying with our people, he made one there. And they have it at the collections at NMAI. And um, 
I don't know of anywhere else where they make the square hand drums. And so that's really a pride, pride for us. And even along like the borders and everything she has, you know, those big, big thunderclouds, you know, she's, she's got everything on it that speaks to, to what it means to be from Fort Peck. You know, she, she, in her dress, it's like, she's talking about the land. She's talking about the environment. She's talking about the sky. She's, she's talking about the people. It's beautiful. I was, I'm really interested in the importance of dreams in the creative practice. Um, I know Juanita talked about how you've woken up and had uh, having had these dreams and then know what a piece wants to be. And I, I was hoping you could speak a little bit to that. I think, you know, the, the tradition of, of, being a dreamer when you are a bead worker and a quill worker, I think that really speaks to, you know, this as a woman's tradition and that, you know, before colonization, before all of that, um, you know, before we even had beads, um, our women were given the gift of quill work. And we had societies and, and we had protocols and traditions that came with being a quill worker. There were certain traditions and protocols that came with being given that gift to create art with quill work. And within those, those teachings, um, you know, oftentimes you were given these things through dreams, you know, it was a matter of, you know, if these, I guess like entities, right. Mm -hmm. They, they come to you in your dreams and they give you designs and they show you how to do something, mm -hmm. you know, they'll sit down with you and they'll, they'll work with you. They'll show you how the stitching goes. They'll show you how to use your hands and you know, we, we know the history of, you know, eventually, you know, through trade, we were, we were given the beads, we were given, you know, needles, we were given all these new materials. And so quill workers adopted and began working with the, the beads. And, but we held on to a lot of those traditions from quill work, right? And so, you know, I think that really speaks to where those dreams come from. And, and that, you know, a lot of, a lot of contemporary bead workers, like, like my grandma, like my mom and myself, you know, we're still dreamers, you know, we still get visits and, you know, I know, I know my mom, she's several times, she wakes up in the middle of the night. Oh yeah. And it's, you know, you have to be, that's when it's fresh, right? So if they give you something like that and you are lucky enough to see it and I've had just flashes of things that were already made, right? So I know how it's got to be and, and the general look of it. And so um, just for example, the horse mask that I did for NMAI, that came to me in a dream. So I had to, I had to fulfill that and make that because it was asked of me to do that. So, um, and then I didn't start quill working until I dreamt of it. And this is just the way, um, we work out of respect for that, those old quill working societies. We figured that, you know, that meant something to them that that was part of their initiation and was to be believing in those dreams and to have that happen. The presence of American flags and in indigenous artworks has such a complicated history with often very personal resonances. And I think this is a, a perfect example of that. Um, yes, I, I did this bag when we were living, it was like 1980, 1976. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We lived in Oswego, Montana, which is the middle of Assiniboine country. And, um, I was just sitting there working on it and uh, one of our relatives works for the road, the tribal road department, the heavy equipment. And he came by visiting, his name was uh, Buddy Pipe. He's my relative from Chelsea. That's where his family comes from too. And he, they were, 
they were breaking ground south of Wolf Point, which is a few miles east of uh, Oswego, where we were living. And he came o came over and he was just kind of sad. And he said that they dug up about 300 Assiniboine burials down there, south of Wolf Point, where they were clearing for housing and, and stuff. And it just made me feel bad, you know? So I was working on that. So I had the flag up on the other, the way it's supposed to be, but I just turned it upside down then at that time. She was just acknowledging the distress of her people. Yeah. And it was because of, um, it was a mass burial for of about 300 Assiniboine peoples. And it was because um, early in the reservation era, um, shortly after Fort Peck agency was first established, um, the federal government failed to get Assiniboine peoples enough rations and medicines. And it, they knew the problem was coming. Um, you know, the agents at the time continuously wrote to um, to Washington telling them, you know, we need more provisions for the Assiniboine population. We need more, we need more. They're not going to make it. And um, the federal government failed and they didn't, they didn't get us our rations. We didn't get our food. We didn't get our medicine. And because of that, um, it, our people starved, you know, our people were sick. And so we, we lost about 300 Assiniboine peoples from that. And um, they went ahead and they just made a mass burial and it was unmarked. It, you know, that part of our history wasn't documented. It wasn't shared. It wasn't, um, it, w it was missing. And so, you know, that day when my grandma was sitting there, you know, and her relative comes by and he's distraught, it was a matter of how come we didn't even know this? How come we didn't know this was there? Mm -hmm. And it was traumatizing. It was upsetting because, you know, those were our family members. And at the time I did that, it was just made for dancing. Like my, um, my, um, one of my brothers used to use it traditional dancing and stuff and I just had it hanging on the wall and and when I met Ted he just really liked it and liked the story so Ted purchased it for me so I figured it was going to a good place. And now it's at the Met. <laughs> <laughs> yeah now it's at the Met. Um First of all, Juanita, congratulations for best of show at the 2021 Heard Museum Indian Market. Um, this piece is now in the museum's collection. And this is just such an incredible um, doll. And I know we'd all love to hear more about how past and present meet in this dress. Yeah, well, um... I really didn't want to make any kind of comments or art pieces on the pandemic, on this COVID pandemic. Um, but uh, I, I kind of felt inspired by all the indigenous face masks that I'd been seeing on online. And um, I, I really felt like it was a sad time because it was hitting our people so hard. And I didn't know if I wanted to, um, draw attention to it. And then I thought, you know, that this is part of our history that, and, and, um, so I, I decided that I would, um, call attention to all of the pandemics that we had survived as peoples. And it's been with us throughout our history. And, um, I thought that, uh, this would be a good way to say, you know, that We've lived, we've lived through those and we're still here. And I decided that, uh, you know, that we're going to, we're going to make it through this. And this is my piece saying that, you know, we're still here. 
we're going to be okay. We're going to make it through this. And, um, so she's her name. I named her, uh, Wakia Tatanka and that's a strong willed person. So she's a very strong person. And, uh, the penny dress that she's wearing is something that, um, came from the Lakota people. And it was an honoring, like a, a, a way to say that we're living in the modern world, but we still have our traditions. So it's kind of a dual culture, dual cultural walking in two worlds, walking in two worlds kind of symbol. And then, um, with the, you know, I beaded her face mask. Of course I had to beat her a fancy face mask to go along with how fancy her dress turned out. And, um, so I decided that she needed to stand on the, the COVID, um, virus. And so I beaded that and that's what she's standing on as a beaded image of that virus. And so then I put her name on the front part of it where she stands. And then I put, um, the other pandemics that we survived the introduction of smallpox. And then I put the Spanish flu on the back and then COVID-19 on the side. And the, and I just had to limit it. You know, we had a lot of pandemic things. When I was making her, my mom told me, this isn't the first time I've had to wear a mask in my lifetime. And isolate. And isolate. She had um, the tuberculosis pandemics that were going through the reservations when she was a child. And so she had to actually be put in the Sioux Sanatorium in Rapid City, South Dakota, separated from her family and had to stay there while she recovered, thankfully. It does. So on her, I thought it was important to include uh, our traditional medicines, some of our traditional medicines. And so she has a skirt wrap that is painted in the ledger style. And I just drew some of our um, important medicines that we use uh, to help us get through these sicknesses and stuff. So there's, you know, sage and cedar and, um, the echinacea root I put on there and, um, a couple other things I think too. Uh, and then I, I went outside and I was thinking, cause I've done it many times with, uh, our dolls is that I will put, uh, our, have them holding sage or sweet grass or something in, um, our cedar tree gave me a branch had just fallen. And, and so I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to let her hold the cedar. And so I put some in her uh, bandolier bag so she can carry that medicine with her. And then I gave her some sage that Jessa had sent me. Some woman sage. It's like she's armed and ready. She's <laughs> armed and ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought it was, um, it was just my comment on our, our our time and our struggles that we all have had to go through as Indian peoples. And, and just to say that, you know, we're still strong and we're going to make it through this pandemic. Okay. I think I would like to add just that, you know, this specific doll that, you know, my mom has been able to create, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic, I think really speaks to these traditions and this practice that, you know, we generations later are holding on to these very specific tribal knowledges and we're living them every day, but we're also able to speak to our contemporary surroundings. We're able to, to speak to our contemporary existence, utilizing those traditions. And, and I think that, you know, that's where we're going. That's where we see beadwork and cool work taking us and, you know, maintaining who we are and maintaining our cultural ways. And I think it's a real blessing to, to be sitting in between these women and oh. <laughs> <laughs> to know that they've taught me and I'll teach my daughter and she'll teach her daughters and generations from now, they'll still be using these things and, and carrying these knowledges and these teachings and maintaining who they are as contemporary indigenous women. Well, through your collaborative creation, you are honoring the past and passing it forward to the next generation and the next and the next, as you say. And so thank you um, so much for a close look at your works and for the wonderful stories 
um, themes and memories they evoke. Thank you for having us there. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs>